Good morning. Okay, if you are a woman of childbearing age, please stand up. We have a little special something something for you. So if you're a current mom, or you could be, or you wanted to be, please stand up. And we have some beautiful guests. All women, please stand up. All women, please stand up. We want to honor you. We want to say that we see you today. We want to say that you are doing an amazing job. And you are not just raising sons and daughters. You're raising mothers and fathers. So that's what you're doing. And we stand with you and we applaud you. And we say, today is your day. Thank you, moms. We love you. Thank you. We're, we're getting to you. I love this. Thank you so much, students. You guys are a blessing. It's an honor to be your moms. You get a rose. You get a rose. You get a rose. Their op- Oprah moment. Anybody want two? Thank you, Next Gen team. You guys are rock stars. <laughs> you guys are awesome. And then middle schoolers and high schoolers and warriors, if you guys want to come back, you can take a seat right here in the front. You are a very welcome part of our service today. You are always welcome up front or on the side, wherever you feel comfortable. I do want to do something special for the single moms in the house. So if you're a single mom and you are actively raising children, would you stand? Okay. Wait, wait, wait. We are going to clap, but we're going to do something more than clap. I want you to get out your wallets and we were going to give these single moms some cash. Because I can't think of a single, single mom that doesn't need some cash right now. So let's bless these single moms with some cash and tell them how much we love them and let's honor them. Pull them wallets out. Pull them out. Pull them out. Here, go give, go give that to Anna. Go give, go give. Go give, go hug, go love, go honor. All the single mamas, we love you. We see you in a pink dress right there. Single moms, we love you. We see you. We honor you. We support you. We break off a spirit of poverty. We're just going to sucker punch it right in the face today. We say more, more to every single mom here. We break it off. Today is your tipping point. Today is your breakthrough. You have more than enough than you will ever need, ask, or imagine. This is your promise. This is a turning point. You don't have to wonder if there's going to be bread in the cupboards anymore. Jesus sees you. And he knows what you need. And he's a good father. Your children will not be in lack. Our, our children don't have to suffer the same things that we've suffered because it stops here. Today, I've titled our talk, Fight for Restoration, and we are in for a treat. So look at your neighbor and say, let's go. Let's go. Today is unique. Today is a day we honor mothers. And a couple years ago, there was a website. It was the number one child porn site, and it was called Motherless. Dot com. Mothers, we are not just protectors, we're preventers. Your presence in a child's life, whether yours or someone else's, is ushering in the presence of God and the will of God. It's also blocking what the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. Do not underestimate your presence in a child's life. We honor you. Well, like Brandon said, 2020 was a doozy. We had a front row seat on the struggle bus. (laughs) And it was challenging. 
And for our family, we're still contending for some miracles. We're still contending for some breakthrough. And so today I want to share with you just a couple tips that we have learned, just four tips. And then I have a special surprise for you at the very end. But in our fight for restoration, relationship restoration, it could be with a family member, it could be with a coworker, it could be with a neighbor, it could be anybody. But in my life, we've learned four things. And I wanted to share that with you this morning. The first thing we learned is that there is a reason for the order of everything that is happening. And the reason I put that in quotes is because God said that to me. Not just once, twice. I woke up from dreams over this last year and the Lord said, there's a reason for the order of everything that's happening. Is anybody here glad that their high school sweetheart broke up with them so that you could find your real mate? Yeah. <laughs> my, my husband's raising his hand. Yes. <laughs> There is a reason for the order. That breakup that was so devastating back yonder, there's a reason that had to happen so that another breakthrough could come. And I could think of hundreds of examples over this last year, but really my whole life, where something happened and it was like, oh, this isn't a gift at all. But what it does, it is it shut a window so a door could open. And so I want you to start thinking that way in your life, that there's a reason why you didn't get that job. There's a reason why you didn't get that phone call or why it came at a certain time. So when you abide by this principle, you're saying there's no poverty thinking here because God is outside of time. He's never in a rush. And he gets to say, hey, I'm not rushed. You don't need to be. So the poverty thinking, which says, I don't have enough time. God needs to hurry up. That stops because we're not in a rush. We're not in a hurry. God's not stressed. Your bills, your payment date doesn't scare him. He's like, I got you, girl. I got you. He's more than enough. The second thing we learned over this last year is that to, to the degree, this is key, to the degree of stress that you're going through, it's just as important to have as much or more fun. Okay. So last year, when we were on the struggle bus, some of you were there with us, we decided we wanted to just sucker punch that poverty spirit in the face. And when everything seemed like it was dry, like we were like ankle deep in the Red Sea looking for where our kayak was. And we decided as a family, we needed to go do something that was gonna refuel our souls. So we found this water park and I took this quick little video to show you that this is what we did. <laughs> This is me and my children. And the little Zoe, who was six years old at the time, comes off the little slide. But that's no joke. <laughs> so we would climb six stories of stairs and then you would go flying down this slide. It would launch you up into outer space, it felt like. And then you would land in this lake. And it was so fun. And it recharged us as a family to say, we're in this together, we're united, I got your back, I'm with you, I'm for you. Because rem remember, we're not fighting flesh and blood. Come on we're fighting spirits that want to steal our fun, our joy, you know why? Because yeah. Satan doesn't have any joy, he has to try to steal ours. Yeah. So when you're going through a stressful time, I can't encourage you enough, get out and have some fun. Get out and have some fun because in his presence is the fullness of joy. That's right. That's right. There is nowhere that you can have more joy than in his presence. So whatever you're going through today, let your joy meter, your fun meter match the attack That's right. or surpass it. You have permission. Let's go. All right, it's worth it. The third thing that we learned as a family, and this is probably the greatest tool that we learned last year is that we need to renounce the what if spirit. Has anybody heard of the what if spirit? It's a doozy. This is a spirit that says, well, what if your worst fears actually did happen? What if the very thing that you'd never want to happen, have you just stopped and thought about that? Well, what happens is when you start believing that could happen is you're giving your faith to the wrong kingdom. 
It's called fear. So when you're believing that it's actually going to happen, you're having faith in it. The problem is it's the wrong thing. So my husband was on the floor of our shower weeping. And he heard the Lord say, you renounce that what if spirit. To renounce something means I used to own it. I used to claim it as mine and I'm giving it up. I no longer want to be associated with it. So you have that invitation today. You might be holding on to this what if spirit and somebody has told you that that's called being a good steward or it's called being prepared, but really it's robbing you of joy. It's robbing you of being fully present with your families and you're not hearing the voice of the Lord because you're all concerned about what could happen. And so today you get to break that what if spirit. Right now in your seat, you just renounce it and you say, what if spirit, I renounce you. You go to the feet of Jesus and you give account for every trauma that you've caused me. You don't have access to my life anymore. So as my husband and I would drive, we were like in the car and he'd just say, I renounce you, what if spirit? And I was like, oh yeah, you're having a moment, me too. (laughs) And my phone would ring and I wouldn't know who it is. And you know, that thought comes up. I renounce you, what if spirit? Because then I can be fully present and I can answer the phone, not thinking about what could go wrong, but what could go right. Because a lot of you have been walking in hopelessness for too long. And hope is the joyful expectation of good. So turn to your neighbor and say, get your hopes up. Get your hopes up. Start thinking about what could go right. Renouncing the what if spirit closes the door on a victim or an orphan mentality that says, my dad doesn't care about me. But it opens the door to say, I have a good, good father that loves me and goodness and mercy will follow me every day of my life. That's what the scripture says, so that's what I'm standing on. I don't care that it's flu season or hurricane season or whatever. No, we rebuke that. There is no season for evil. God's always in a good mood. Okay, the fourth thing I wanna share is to bless your enemies. Anybody had somebody in your life that it was difficult to pray for? Okay, okay, in case you haven't, I have. Last year, Travis and I would go on date nights and as we would walk, it was about 9 p.m. every night that I start to get these cysts in my foot. On the top of my foot, there are two balls, almost like golf balls, and they would, I couldn't walk after a while. It would just stop me in my tracks. I was like, this is so weird. I could go to the doctor, I could get this drained. I don't know where this is coming from. I've never had a problem with cysts on my foot. And they just appeared. I couldn't even put my tennis shoe on one day. Travis and I began to pray and we saw a vision of two people in my life that were causing a lot of pain, sitting in their chairs, speaking word curses over me. And I said, nope. I'm going to bless them and I'm going to break off those word curses. And before our very eyes, the cysts disappeared and they have never come back. I don't want you to miss out on an opportunity to bless somebody that might not be receiving a blessing and might actually want to curse you. So if there's a pit in your stomach right now that that person might walk in, you have permission to get out your phone and text them and bless them. Because I took this opportunity six months ago and that person and I are meeting this week. That's the kind of restoration that's happening. That's the kind of walls that are breaking down because I'm refusing to have what's called a root of bitterness take root in my heart and steal all kinds of restoration and joy and family and hope and good things from my life and my kids. And so I get to speak blessing over those enemies and watch the healing and wholeness take place in your life. Some of you have lower back pain right now, but it's actually a spiritual root. It's unforgiveness. And so God isn't just concerned about your healing, which is healing the lower back pain. He wants your wholeness, which is your heart, to forgive and release that person. That was the fourth tip that I wanted to pass on to you, that that person that you think is that big obstacle in your life, they might just be the key to your breakthrough. Because you're not wrestling flesh and blood. So 
There is a verse in the Bible, Psalm 119.99, that says, I have more understanding than all of my teachers. For your testimonies, say testimonies, testimonies. are my meditation. Okay, a little Hebrew lesson, right? The word testimony comes from two words, ed, ud. It's kind of like, hey, dude. Say, hey, dude. Good, you just spoke Hebrew. Okay, so ed, ud. Ed says witness. That's what it means. And ud means do it again. What does the word testimony mean? Do it again. When I'm going through my struggle bus season, I deliberately look for people that have testimonies in the area that I'm contending for. And I say, God, you did it with them. Could you do it again? Please, Lord. So that's what my family and I have been doing. We've been finding people that are just before us in the breakthrough season, because we're still in the shadow. We're still in the valley, but I know that my mountaintop day is coming. And I'm not forsaken, I'm not alone, but I'm gonna surround myself with a cloud of witnesses and a testimony that says he can do it again. Yes. So in Mark 8, Jesus plays a little game, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, called Remember When. <laughs> so the disciples are in the boat and they're saying, oh shoot, did you remember the bread? No, oh gosh, did you remember the bread? We forgot the bread. We're going to the party, we forgot the bread. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, says, guys, remember the 5,000 people? How many loaves did we need, kids? How many loaves fed the 5,000 people? Five, thank you. Five loaves fed 5,000 people. Five loaves couldn't feed us. But five loaves fed 5,000 people and there were leftovers. Then a little bit later, there was 4,000 people gathered around Jesus and they only had seven loaves of bread and they fed all 4,000 people and had leftovers. So fast forward a few more days and they're saying, did you get the bread? And Jesus is like, oh, remember when? Remember when we fed all those people? And the disciples kind of probably got that deer in the headlight look. Oh yeah, that's you. That's you. They were familiar with the stories of Jesus. They remembered what he did, but they didn't let it change the way they thought. When impossible things look possible, you have begun to look like, to think like God. When impossible things look possible, you have begun to think like like God. We're all familiar with testimonies, but has it changed the way we think? The word repentance actually means to change the way you think. We all get to repent every day. And what allows us to repent is his kindness. His kindness is overflowing to where he says, hey, sweetie, I know you once thought one way. I'm inviting you into a new way, a better way come with me because you have revelation. And when you have revelation, you're on the precipice of repentance. So there's some things that the spirit is revealing today and repentance is a rightful response. God can't get any bigger, but our view of him can. And so as our family was going through a difficult season, I said, Lord, please bring me people that have gone through what I've gone through or similar and ex achieved and experienced the results that you brought. And a couple weeks later, I was at Amy Patterson's party and I ran into a friend, a new friend named Christina. And she made a beeline for me, kind of one of those awkward Holy Spirit ways where she's like, I don't really know why I'm saying this, but blah, 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 blah. and I just stood there, deer in the headlights, like, I know exactly why you're sharing that. So I'm gonna invite my friends, Christina and Nate to come up and we're gonna chat for a few minutes. Would you stand and help me welcome Christina and Nate? Okay, somebody's getting chairs. Okay, we'll start standing and then we will transition. I just wanna start off by saying it is so good to be here because this is a place of family. Yeah. And the reason why I say that because it is so important to have family in your life, whether it's blood family or 
people that God has brought in your life. Because when you go through valleys, you need people. And um, over the last five years, Nate and I have kind of like been one foot in a valley and like one foot on a mountain at the same time, like (laughs) stumbling through. Um, It's been a hard season, but we've had people in our life. We've had community. And um, it is so important to have people that rejoice with you in the good times and are there for you in the difficult times. Um, But when we were kind of like thinking about what what should we say, because Nate's going to share mostly about our past. Um, God brought to my heart the word hopelessness. And I got just a quick picture of this beautiful valley, beautiful mountains, but a rough looking valley. And um, thank you. And I heard God say, like, I didn't, I didn't give you a portion of hopelessness. That's not the portion that I gave you. I'm a good father. Come on. The portion that I gave you is hope. And I felt like today there's some of you out there who have been sitting with a portion of hopelessness yeah. for too long. And it's time to throw that away, throw that plate away. It doesn't belong yeah. on your table. And to claim the portion that the good father gave you, which yeah. is hope. And even in the valley, even when the valley is hard, there's still that hope. And yeah. God's hope brings peace and mm-hmm. joy no matter what you're going through. Mm-hmm. I'm a preacher there. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to condense this down because it's, it's a long story, but I just have an outline, so don't, don't get Perfect. too scared. All right. So about five years ago, we um, had a very interesting, you know, we were singing about the refiner song, talking about, you know, purify me and stuff and this purifying fire. And that sounds great when we sing it, but when it actually happens, it sucks. Amen. And, but it's ultimately very rewarding, but um, it's hard to see that, yeah. you know, when you're going through it. So in uh, 2015, actually, I'm going to go back just a little bit further. So with my father, I know it's Mother's Day, but with my father, I, you know, we, I grew up, I was a lot more like my mom, so we may not have like connected as well. And because he was going through, uh, you know, he was kind of more focused on his work and appearances and titles and things like that. And so we never really connected strongly. A lot of times it felt like I had the leftovers when he came home. Uh, And so growing up, you know, I love my dad, but I never really connected with my dad and had like those kind of, you know, Andy Griffith type moments, you know, those sort of things. So, um, and so, but I still love my dad and we had a relationship and, and went on just kind of through the motions, you mm-hmm. know. Um, and then in 2015, uh, my mom suddenly passed away uh, from sepsis and, in October 2015. And that was a big shakeup because she kind of was the glue for our family. She made sure, like, she always called us and she always made sure dad went and called me or we did stuff Mm -hmm. together. She was kind of the one facilitating everything. Mm -hmm. Um, So when she died, it kind of threw our family into a little bit of a tailspin um, where we were, you know, going closer to God, but at the same time struggling. And and during that time is when my dad kind of, a lot of what we didn't know had started to occur, meaning that over the past few years, he'd been stealing our identity um, and racking it up you know, thousands of dollars in debt and betraying our trust. And so we found that out and with other other things going on, it started to, the relationship was just like splintering, fracturing. Mm -hmm. And he was growing, going, he was kind of going another direction. We were going another one. And then with the criminal activity, with a lot of counsel from people that were here at the time, Pastor Francis, Pastor Bob, um, we decided we had to turn him into the police, me and my sister. So, uh, so that was not an easy decision to make, you know? Um, and so we, during that, so we had to do that. I worked for my dad at the time. So I lost my job. Um, I was losing, I lost my mom a year ago and now I lost my dad. Wow. And, um, so what, so that was the beginning of this refining fire that we were going through. Um, and like Christina was saying, we were on the mountaintop and then we're down in the ditch and then we're up on the mountain and down Mm -hmm. the ditch. So it was kind of like that, but God was, was present and providing 
in every circumstance. He likes to make it dramatic, and he does the 11th hour thing where it's like, oh, here's your <laughs> money you needed. Here's your job right at the last second. Took a few years off your life. With the... <laughs> but um, so during that time, we were going through our own process, and when we were going through that process, we were... We had done YWAM. We had done a lot of these things that required a lot of faith. God was really showing up in our lives. And through that whole time, through community mm -hmm. of strong people in, our, in my life and in Christina's life, we were able to walk through forgiveness. Um, at this time, for, so mind you, from 2016 on, I, like for a long time, I did not speak with my dad. I did not communicate with him. He was in jail at the time. Um, and so we, we I, was, I did a lot of, processing of this, like forgiving dad. And forgiveness was not about absolving him of anything that he had mm -hmm. done, but it was about cleaning out all of the gunk in my heart, yeah. you know, and yeah. processing li life, memories, yeah. relationships. Um, and, prepare, and in hindsight, it's more of like a preparation, right. you know, that right. if my dad ever does decide to change, mm -hmm. which in my heart, I was like, no, nah, it's not going to happen. Um, but in my, but I knew I need to have my heart right in case that day comes. Because yeah. if I'm not ready and he does change, yeah. will yeah. I accept it? Right. And the answer was probably no. I would have scrutinized every little thing. You know, does, is this a joke? Is he lying? Is he trying to mm -hmm. trick me? No. So, so that was something that we kind of walked through and were able to find forgiveness mm -hmm. in our hearts. And we would even pray with the kids at night. They prayed for Tan Tan, because that's their grandpa name for him. We'd pray for mm -hmm. Tan Tan. We'd pray for, that God would meet him and find him. And, and so uh, fast forward a few years later, and this is last year, um, we, you know, get a call. My sister has started talking with my dad earlier because she was going through her own kind of refining fire with uh, her family. And so she had not forgiven my dad. She finally started that process and contacted him. So she had been in contact with him. And then in around, a little before Thanksgiving of last year, she says, dad's getting out. She calls me like, dad's getting out and I'm picking him up at the jail. And I'm like, this is kind of surreal, but yeah, okay. So um, he gets out and before I'd never felt a strong obligation to go talk with him. So we felt, me and Christina felt, well, yeah, I want to see who he is now. It's been four years, you know, so I, is he the same guy? Is he, is the same kind of jargon and strategy is going to be there? So we wanted to see who he was. So Thanksgiving day, we brought him a leftover plate, of Thanksgiving food and, uh, sat down at his apartment. Um, and what I can say is he was not my dad in the best way possible. He was not the man I knew. I think he had become or was on the process of becoming the man God had intended him to be a long wow. time ago. And so we sat in his little apartment at his little table and we shared each of our hearts and experiences. Um, he thought we came to read him the riot act and have the airing of grievances as Frank Costanza used to say, right? Uh, got a lot of problems with you people. Um, but instead we, you know, we came and we said, and, and uh, we said like, we didn't come here to berate you. You know, we, we worked through that anger, but we did come to see who you are today. Yeah. And that began a process of us. Well, actually, it wasn't really even a process. It, became, it was almost like the moment of reconciliation mm -hmm. at that moment. And of course, in my mind, I had been, you know, the what ifs. Yeah. So dad, yeah, when dad gets out, I'm going to make him do this so yeah. that he has to prove himself and then he's going to prove himself through this mm -hmm. and he's going to prove himself through that. Then he's got to jump through this hoop of fire and then he's got, you know, all these <laughs> ridiculous ideas of like proving, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and God, <laughs> when it happened, but after we met with him, it was like, he's like, well, is it okay if I call you Tuesday? Dad, and dad calls me Tuesday. We have an hour-long conversation about the grace of God and how wonderful wow. God is which that's never happened before. And then all of a sudden, a couple weeks later, he spent the night at our house. Wow. And <laughs> so it was, so what was funny was my perception of how reconciliation was going to look was completely abandoned. Right. And because God was like, if you 
do the work of mm-hmm. forgiveness mm-hmm. and being ready to accept right. change if it comes, right. then, and if your other person, the, you know, in my case, my dad, but if your friend, yeah. uh, relative, spouse, whatever it is, if they come back yeah. and they have come with a humble heart, contrite, and humbled themselves before mm-hmm. you and God and are ready to make a change, if yeah. you both do the work, when you get together, yeah. our concept of a process is just moot <laughs> at that point. It's going, and it's just going to be accelerated. Accelerated, yeah. right? And so um, that is pretty much, um, this whole thing is just a miracle in itself of how that actually happened because I honestly never thought it would happen. And, and what's your dad's name? Uh, George. Can you guys stand and help me welcome George? that coming (laughs) yes I'm that dad Um, (laughs) you're gonna have to forgive me since I've been out of jail November 17th of 2020 the Lord has transplanted and put a faucet in my eyes (laughs) and uh, I literally and the kids will attest to this I never cried (laughs) I never cried. I'm 64 years old. Until God got me in that jail, I never cried. And so I am thankful for tears. Mm -hmm. You know, I uh, don't feel worthy to be in front of you guys. But in November of 2019, I was met by the king of all kings in a cell. And you, you've got to understand, those of you that have been in church your whole life, I was a PK, preacher's kid. I went to church more than most people. Yeah. Um, I was baptized eight times by my father. <laughs> I think he knew what my future was. He was trying right, to do right. something. I'm not sure what it was. <laughs> but I had spent my life up to the events that Nate shared trying to pretend to be a Christian. Hmm. I was on church boards. I was on Christian school boards. Mm-hmm. I, I could talk the best game you could ever hear. Mm. I could talk a client into anything. Mm-hmm. And the enemy convinced me that I was big stuff. Mm. Okay. And I want to take you back to the, the Sunday after the protector of our family. My wife, Marcia, passed away. Yeah. Some of you may recognize me, not from the post office, so, but you may recognize me from the front doors at this church. My wife and I were greeters here from 2006 yeah. all the way through 2015 to the day she died. Wow. And so when she passed away, some of you may remember this, our whole family, the Sunday after she passed away, stood right here. And Pastor Bob prayed over our family. Mm. How many were here and remember that? Wow. And I want to make a confession here to my kids. I've never talked to them about this. But <laughs> I, I basically forced them to come that Sunday. We were in incredible pain. Incredible pain. But I almost physically made them come to that. They didn't want to. And I was not sensitive to their feelings. And for pride purposes only, Mm. I brought them up Mm -hmm. on this stage and had Pastor Bob pray over them. Mm. And I thought I was just the most spiritual giant you could ever imagine. And that was a turning point, ladies and gentlemen, in my life. Because from that point on, because I established in my own mind that I was spiritual... And I wasn't being led by the Holy Spirit. I lost everything. Hmm. It was a process. Took Mm -hmm. a few little while. But I lost everything. Hmm. And so family. 
I apologize mm -hmm. publicly to you for that. Secondly, I don't even know how to express this, but the, the pain you feel as a father when you realize you've hurt your children so severely mm -hmm. and then have to realize that they have to turn you in to the police. Mm. I, I, I've gone through so many, <laughs> many uh, years, last, actually the last four years going through that, and it was, it was so difficult. But a lot of you here, including Pastor Francis, mm -hmm. advised them and walked the walk with them. And do you know something? That advice was the perfect advice that was needed for me to get where I'm at now and to get my family where they are now. Mm -hmm. That had to be done. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a tough thing for them. Yeah. Obviously a tough thing for me. Yeah. But it goes right up with what Rebecca said on point number one up there, that mm -hmm. all things work together mm -hmm. in order yeah. for what Christ wants. Yeah. So I'm going to try to speed this up. <laughs> I have a lot to say. <clears throat> so in November... Of 2019, I was in the fourth year of a six-year prison sentence. And I'm sitting in my cell. I still had been pretty obstinate the first few years I was in jail. And I was sitting there, and I realized I have nobody. Mm -hmm. I, I have nobody. I, I, by court order, can't contact my kids. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to contact me anyway. My brothers that alienated, all my wife's family, every single person in my life mm -hmm. was gone. Wow. Um, I'm not getting mail in jail. I'm not getting phone calls in jail. I am completely lost. Yeah. And that was the first time that I got to a point in my life where I felt complete, which seems to be the theme of the day, hopelessness. Yeah. I literally sat in that cell and I don't know if you've been to this point in your life, and I hope you never have to, but sometimes the Lord will allow us to get there to get mm -hmm. us to that mountaintop. Yeah. And I literally, for three days wow. in that, I, was, I went through this purging, this, this asking God in every possible way to meet me. You know, I, I didn't know whether to try to get rid of myself. I didn't know what to do, but I knew that I had to fight something and I had to fight through and get to the end of whatever that is. Yeah. And so during that time, God showed me four things and he clarified them actually this Friday in more clarity so I could share them with you. But the first thing he taught me in that three days was number one, I have con unconditional love for you. Come on. I created you. I know exactly who you are. There is nothing, unconditional means no condition can change it. There is nothing that you have done that is going to separate you from my love. Preach. Number two is I will unconditionally forgive you yeah. every single time. Yeah. Not once, not twice, yeah. 70 times seven, he will forgive you. Does that mean that he wants us to sin? Absolutely not. But at that moment, God showed me that I didn't make mistakes. I knew what I was doing. I sinned. Mm. And until I realized I sinned and didn't accidentally hurt my kids, mm -hmm. take their credit, hurt other clients, I would never be able to experience the love of God that he had for me. Wow. Number three, he said, if you accept those two things, and by the way, when you're in turmoil, you're looking for one thing, and that's peace. And I was in turmoil. And he's, the Lord told me, if you accept my love, my forgiveness, you will have unconditional peace. Here, yeah. Does that mean you're going to have a perfect yeah. life? Absolutely not. But I can tell you in front of God, in front of my kids, that since that November of 2019, God has given me a peace that passes not only all understanding, it doesn't yeah. make sense. Right. And when I got to that point, mm -hmm. I was feeling, man, this is great. God loves me. He forgives me. I'm going to have peace. 
And then it was like in my cell, the mood changed. Mm. <laughs> and he said, but I expect something from you. I expect unconditional obedience. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> because if I'm willing to give all for you through my love and through my forgiveness and through my peace, the least, the least you can do for me is be obedient. And not only obedient in the big things, but obedient in the small things. Yeah. And once again, to shorten this up as much, I'm so sorry. Don't apologize. I, I got immediately this sense that the Lord was putting me in school. Yeah. I really did. And starting on that day, when God, cle- those three days when God cleaned me out, Every day I was in jail for the next year, Mm. he was taking my old integrity, which was worthless, Mm. and building up every aspect of my life. Um, George, are you going to lie anymore? Mm. He put me in a situation that day in the jail Mm. where I had a choice. Wow. Am I going to exaggerate some more? Yeah. Am I going to talk a good game Mm -hmm. and try to manipulate people a certain direction? Time after time after time. And so we get fast forward to November 17th, 2020, and the Lord has just been working on me. I feel so unworthy, but God is all over me, and we are released early (laughs) from the jail on a special work program, and I'm able to be with my entire family. Wow. So... If you would humor me for one more item, I'd like my granddaughter Haley to come up. On the Saturday when uh, we were united after Thanksgiving, I went over for lunch with the family, stayed with them, and I got back home, and I looked in my jacket pocket, and I felt something. And it was, it was a letter. And I didn't know where it had come from. So I opened it up. And this is what it said. Dear Tantan, I know what happened. And I've been thinking about it. I forgive you. I'm not just saying that, too. I believe people can change. So I'm ready to give you another chance. God is, too. He is waiting for you to run into his arms again. We've all done bad things. But we can choose to be kind and learn from our mistakes. We should be willing to give third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and infinity chances because we are going to keep messing up. The good news is God is always going to forgive you, and I will too, because families should always support and respect and forgive each other. We can learn and seek wisdom from each other. It is always possible to do the right thing. God gave me a word for you while I was writing this. It's the word happy. God speaks through many ways. I love you. Sincerely, your granddaughter, Haley McQueen. All of your kids? I'm going to dismiss. There's there's obviously an invitation here. And so what I want you to do, because this is all about family, is if you have kids in the children's ministry, get them, but bring them back because the anointing that was on this family is available to every single person here today. So what I'd like you guys to do, if you're okay with it, is to pray for the families represented here, the relationships represented here, that the breakthrough and the humility that your family has modeled so beautifully is available. So George, would you pray for us? Heavenly Father, we just uh, come before you as a fellowship of believers. We are individual families, Lord, but we also are a bigger family. We're a family here at The Rock that loves you and we adore you. And Lord, I just pray that every single family here that has anything that is causing a separation or a hindrance or a battle in the spirit that's causing division, Lord. We just yeah. ask that your Holy Spirit will intervene right now yes. and take that away. Yes. Life is too short to be separated. Lord, you know my situation. I didn't even see my only grandson 
until just recently. I missed five years of his life. And Father, no one should do that. And Lord, I just ask that you just uh, bring your Holy Spirit into every life so that yeah. they realize that you love them, you yeah. forgive them, you give them peace, and Lord, you will lead us with your Holy Spirit into obedience. Yeah. And Lord, we just thank you for that and give you all the glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. God, I just lift up everybody who's feeling like they are carrying such a large po portion of hopelessness, Lord. You never intended them to carry hopelessness. I pray hope into each marriage, into each relationship between mothers and fathers and children, Lord. I pray hope into financial situations. I pray hope into a broken past, Lord. You are the restorer of all things. We declare your restoration over brokenness in this house today, Father, in your name. You are a good, good father.